There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another In Other Words, which is an occasional series where I talk about words, phrases, grammatical patterns, and idioms that I encounter in my reading. As I often want to remind my viewers, I am not an expert in these matters, but I do love doing deep dives in etymological dictionaries and so on on the internet. So, today's, in other words, is solely from this wonderful novel, Mary McCarthy's The Group. I believe it was published in 1963, and I read it many years later, earlier this year in 2019, with A Buddy Read with Britta Bowler, it's one of Britta's favorite novels, and Ange of Beyond the Pages, and we all absolutely loved it, and it had a lot of great vocabulary. So, the setting is Vassar College in the late 1930s, I believe, and then the lives of the women in this group of university friends follows their lives for the next decade or so. So that's where the vocabulary will come from, and some of it will be quite dated. Most of it that I found was definitely American English, but some of it was very, very British. So let's get started. The first one was mansard or mansarding. Some of the characters in New York City are walking around Manhattan and admiring the green mansarding of the Savoy Plaza. So I found out, I certainly didn't know, that a mansard or a mansard roof is a four-sided hip roof and you can now that i know what it is i will be able to spot it it's easy to spot i'll show you some pictures in a minute because a mansard roof is characterized by t two slopes on each of the, its sides and the lower slope has windows they're called dormer windows and that lower slope is at a steeper angle than the upper okay here's some examples I have seen this kind of roof. I didn't know it had a name. I certainly didn't know what the name was. The name is a mansard, or a mansard roof. First known use in English is 1734. It came from the French mansard, which is short for Toit à la mansard, named after the French architect, Nicolas Francois Mansart, who died in 1666, and he often used I don't know that we anybody argues that he created this type of roof but he used them often in his designs now interesting they, the women in this novel were admiring the green mansarding of the Savoy Plaza now I have looked at some pictures I'll put some up I can't see the two sloped design on the it's long gone the Savoy Plaza but here's some old pictures definitely green but Unless you need to be at a different angle looking from above, I don't see those two sloped that was so distinctive, so easy to see in the other examples. So anybody that knows anything about that, please let me know. So the next word I've found alternatively pronounced estrum or estrum, and it comes from the animal world being in a rut. Being in rut, not in a rut, that's different. Uh, being sexually aroused, the, the term I grew up with on the farm was being in heat. So a state of heightened sexual arousal. And usually almost always applied to the female of the species. Spelling, sometimes the O is left off. So uh, the women at the college are, I think, self-described of living lives of estrum and nymphomania so they were having a good time at college but it sounds vaguely offensive because it's usually applied to and you know i've heard some a woman being in heat her, i've heard it said and it's not a very nice thing to say no you can say it about me all you want i won't take offense but and it it relates to the noun estrus or probably also pronounced estrus here it is from 1815 it goes back to the latin Estrus with an O, which means frenzy or gadfly, and that goes back to the Greek oistrus, is my guess, which means the same thing, but also means sting or anything that makes one mad, a mad impulse. And the etymologists believe that it goes back to the Proto Indo European root EIS. I don't know how you say that, so here it is. 
and that root forms a lot of words related to passion. Another one that we use, it's also dated and not that common, ire, meaning anger, frustration, and estrogen also comes from the same root. So there you go. I encountered the adjective hi-hat, and it was pretty easy to guess that it meant to someone being snobbish, upper crust, but originally it meant a tall hat or especially a top hat, and so that's easy to see how it would come to figuratively mean someone who's snobbish. People say you're getting very high hats since you've lived on Riverdale Drive. It's mostly North American, which is interesting because I would have thought, no, top hats were also American. This one was really fun. Some of the poorer women in the novel lived on Salmon Wiggle, but I didn't even think that that was a dish when in fact it is a dish more commonly known as salmon pea wiggle and apparently nobody knows for sure but what where the wiggle comes from salmon wiggle i thought maybe it's some some particular sex act from the 1930s or a dance st style what the hell is a salmon wiggle but the reason they use wiggle in the name of this dish is it is it's an easy recipe made with canned salmon and peas in a in a kind of a cream sauce or a milk gravy and that the peas would wiggle around on the plate so there you go but i have never heard of it and it sounds easy to make and maybe perhaps could be delicious so i'm going to try it maybe i'll show it to you in a future in other words the culinary edition it's served on toast or crackers or something like that here are some pictures. Uh, a thingamy. It was easy to guess that it was the same meaning as a whatchamacallit or a thingamabob, but I had never encountered thingamy. But it just means a person or thing. I would guess almost always a thing rather than a person whose name the speaker has forgotten, does not know, or doesn't want to mention. But I had never encountered thingamy, but it dates from 1796. Other words that serve this function in the language, and it's a very useful function. And how many of these do you know? Dingus, never heard of that. Doodad, yes. Doohickey, yes. Hickey, not for this meaning. Thingamabob, thingamajig, yes. Whatchamacallit, yep. What not? What's it? What's this? Caracol is the next one, and the only place I had ever heard of this word was it's the title of one of Edmund White's novels, which I have not read. Caracol. So today I learned that in fact what it is, a caracol, is a half turn to the right or the left done by a mounted horse. It's usually, you know, as part of dressage, which is a word I learned because of Mrs. Romney. I'd never heard of dressage, but it's just a thing that horses do when you train them for those hoity toity high hat horse shows. But also the same noun was used in military and cavalry for a combat maneuver when riders of the same squadron turn simultaneously to their right or their left. I'm not sure which came first. I'm guessing the horse thing, because the cavalry's on horses, isn't it? But that they would all have been linked. There is a poem from 1866 entitled Abraham Lincoln, which uses that noun. And in architecture, it means a spiral staircase. Now, I found some footage of a, a horse training doing the caracol and I'm gonna show you a couple minutes of it and I promise you honor bright stay tuned honor brights coming at the end of this video honor bright that I did not choose this particular video excerpt to show you it had nothing to do with the hotness of the rider not at all here you go <laughs> Somebody in the novel had a voice like a querulous 
Grackle. Queer list means whiny or petulant, but Grackle I'd never heard. So Grackle is a songbird of the American blackbird family. And apparently, especially when birds were querulous, they sounded, uh, it was an unpleasant sound. So here's a short excerpt from that. Next is the adjective barmy. And a woman didn't want to be thought of as being barmy. And I know how just how she feels now that I understand that it means mad, crazy, or extremely foolish. It goes back to the early 16th century, meaning frothing or covered with barm. And barm was yeast or leaven or the head of a beer. Going back to Proto-Germanic meaning yeast. And that frothy thing kind of looked like like excitement. It was a way to visualize and speak figuratively of somebody being upset or crazy. And that word barm, going back through German, and it's also shown up in Dutch, and goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, which I won't even try to, well, I'll try to pronounce it, but I'm sure it's wrong. Brew, sounds like brew for beer, right? But here it is which meant to boil, bubble, effervesce, or burn. And then this is where it got really interesting because that root is the root of a lot of words that, and I'm gonna give you the list just like I did last time and just see, let this list kind of wash over you to see if you can feel and hear that bubbling effervescent connotation in this list. Braze, bratwurst, brawn, Brazier, a br brazier like Dairy Queen brazier. Brazil, bread, breed, brew, broth, broil, brood, effervesce, eff um, embroil, ferment, fervent, fervid, fervor, imbroglio. Oh my. That's the part of this that I just love when you get right down to that Proto Indo European root and you see how the the etymological genealogy of all these words is, it, it gets me into an etymological estrum <laughs> one of the male characters confides or confesses that he he comes a cropper with women I go, he comes a cropper what the hell is that the meaning of the phrase is to fall or fail at some venture or at some goal I found a great resource on the web. I will put a link in the show notes to this web page. I think it was from the phrases.org website. And it set it gives the standard etymology etymology or origin and then completely deconstructs it and says that's all crap. It's not true. So I'm gonna skip all that. If you want to understand where people thought it came from, you can check that out. But let me tell you where apparently it does. We have to talk about a horse's behind, which is known as a crew or a crupper. And I have to double check the pronunciation of crew. Croup. It's pronounced croup. Maybe only in America. So French, I would say crew, wouldn't you? So a horse's butt was known as a croup or a crupper. In the 18th century, anybody who fell off a horse was said to have fallen neck and crop. In, we say head over heels or ass over tea kettle, and they used to say neck and crop. And even before that, neck and heels. Same meaning. So come a cropper is a little bit later colloquial way. So this one's definitely British English. Colloquial way of describing a neck and crop or a tumble falling off a horse. That phrase was first found in a book published in 1858 and around the same time, John Houghton's Dictionary of Modern Slang was published in 1859. It came to be more idiomatic. Any kind of failure, not just the failure to stay on the horse. So, cropper, to go a cropper, to come a cropper. It's to fail badly. So this pork sap, this character, said that he uh, comes a cropper with women. He, he just can't, can't get a girlfriend or whatever. Okay, But that, as I was doing that, I got really curious about the word crop meaning like a wheat field like the 
you know, my dad's a farmer and he has crops of wheat, crops of barley, crops of this. So that's the word we use for the field of whatever the grain is, right? And it's totally related to this too, which because it goes back to the old English crop, double P, meaning head or top of a sprout or herb, any part of a medicinal plant except the root. So head or top of a sprout or herb, including wheat or barley or whatever, and that's how we get the word crop that we that, that is used in modern agriculture. But it originally meant the top of the sprout or the plant that you were growing in your field. Also comes into a bird's craw, any kind of protuberance. So bird's gullet, or when it was spelled croup, any rounded item. So a bird's gullet, the seed head of ripe plants, or a horse's behind, all rounded. Okay. There you go. Woof. Honor bright. I had heard it. I had to check it. It just means it's a phrase that you say, across my heart and hope to die, or I promise, or on my honor, honor bright. First found the phrase honor bright in the early 19th century. Some people say it originates from Troilus and Cressida, Shakespeare, the Shakespeare play, 1609. It certainly is found there. Perseverance, dear my lord, keeps honor bright. To have done is to hang, quite out of fashion, like a rusty male in monumental mockery. Next, Puckish. So Puck was also a character in Midsummer Night's Dream, another Shakespeare play. I'm not a much of a Shakespearean person, but I studied I enjoyed studying Shakespeare in college, and I have no interest in watching the plays or reading the plays for enjoyment now, but I did enjoy studying them. That may change as I you know, once I Turn 32 or something, I might wise up. But Puck was the mischievous fairy in Midsummer Night's Dream. No mischievous fairy jokes! Only I get to make mischievous fairy jokes. But Puckish means somebody who likes to make jokes about other people, play silly tricks, be an impish mischievous. So there you go. By the by, I've heard it. It's usually spelled now this way, with the second by being the by, but in fact it originally was by the by without the E on the second one, or by a by or upon the by. And it just means incidentally, or by the way. Now, by the way is the one that I know the most commonly, but you're introducing something that's not as important. It's in passing, interjecting something that's not as important as the main topic under discussion. Now, I found lots of stuff on this on the English Stack Exchange. Have any of you checked that out? I actually contributed to that site for about 10 minutes, no, for about 10 weeks maybe, about seven or eight years ago, and they are the most miserable people on the internet. I got into such raging fights, and they, I've never had anybody be so rude to me, not even on Grindr, as <laughs> the people were on the English Stack Exchange. They're all just arrogant pricks. But some of those arrogant pricks were arguing over what this meant. So, by, the preposition by, apparently dates from the early 17th century, and one of the original Indo-European meanings of by was around, or approximately. Another contributor said that it also carried that meaning in place names that ended with by, Whitby. Uh, Grimsby, those kind of English place names mostly, and some of them were uh, also came into Canada or probably uh, all through North America, that that also had that meaning embedded, but then there was a big fight about it and I lost interest. So anyway, by the by means incidentally. Smitch, somebody was described or some room or something was described as a smitch. Victorian. I thought it might be related to a smidgen, and it is. So it just means a small amount of something. Here it's being used as an adjective, so it would mean a little, a little Victorian. Smitch is not so common. It's Scottish, apparently, meaning a stain or a speck. It also shows up in, North, in the Northumbrian dialect of English. Smidgen, they think, which is what I know. I know smidgen, a smidgen of praise, a smidgen of pizza, a smidgen of... I've only got a smidgen of salt left. I have to go to the store. But smitch I had never heard. 
A Dutch uncle. That was new to me. So a Dutch uncle is the opposite of somebody who is being avuncular. Avuncular means like an uncle, but that means, you know, easygoing and warm and kind of easy to get along with. A Dutch uncle. Apparently, are the Dutch strict? Because a Dutch uncle is uh, somebody who issues frank, harsh, or severe criticism in order to educate, encourage, or admonish someone. Leo? Are you a Dutch uncle? Do you have any Dutch uncles? And then I came across a, a woman who we learn in the Mary McCarthy novel used to stand treat to cocktails. So I wondered, and yes, it's true, it's related to treating someone, so paying for someone, paying for someone's cocktails. She used to stand treat to cocktails, but it sounded strange to me. So it means you pay for somebody else, usually in a restaurant or bar. The verb stand without treat just that one word verb stand that's one of the meanings of it to pay the cost of something to pay the cost of a treat I'll stand you a dinner to stand drinks for someone it means to pay for somebody else as a treat and that dates from 1821 and I had never heard that in modern English what I'm used to is to treat someone but you can see how it kind of went through all of those dipsy doodles horripilated it means when your hair stands up because you are scared it's, or to have goosebumps, have goose pimples, horripilate. I've never heard of it. It's, not, it's an awful word that we don't need. It's one of those Latinate words. It's just ridiculous, but it's interesting. Horripilate. So you're horrified and your hair, well, if you have hair, your hair stands on end. It comes from a Latin word, horripilatus. Now, you can hear, I've there's some words about removing body hair depilate depilate so there must be something there because it means of hairs or to bristle to stand on end to shiver to tremble and it, yes so it goes back to the proto-indo-european root pill a french leave it's informal it's dated and it means being absent from work or being absent from duty without permission it could be something relatively innocuous, like leaving a party without saying goodbye to everybody because you don't want to disturb the host, or a soldier leaving his post without authorization, a little bit more serious. First recorded in English in 1771, at a time when English and French cultures were all tangled up together. But the hilarious thing is, in French, the equivalent phrase is filet à l'anglaise to leave English style. And many of the um, translations into other languages, they use the English style, not French leave, it's English leave in many other languages, so. But apparently, it did start in France, I'm sorry, in the 18th century, but it was imitated in England of uh, a custom of going away from a reception without taking leave. Humphrey Clinker, the Smollett novel, has an example of that in 1771. And then in the military, the Spanish version of this phrase for military is, and I can't pronounce Spanish, certainly not with a Spanish accent, despedida a la Francesca, so they use the French. And apparently uh, dating back to the Napoleonic campaign in the Iberian Peninsula. In fine fettle. I knew it. I knew what it meant. It means to be in good health or good spirits, but I thought, again, this is a good chance to do a little bit of a deep dive on why. It seems to go back to the old English word fettle, F-E-T-E-L, which meant belt, but again, people aren't really sure. But there are several meanings of the noun fettle. The idiom to be in fine fettle, that's the only meaning, but fettle has other meanings, which I thought were interesting to look at. One is, and this is related totally to the idiom, a state of proper physical condition, kilter, or trim. Another one is one's mental states, closely connected. Another one is sand used to line a furnace. Jacqueline of Six Minutes for Me was just talking about Jordy, doing a Jordy accent. So Jordy is, a, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's a nickname for a person from the Tyneside area of Northeast England and the dialect used by its inhabitants. In the Jordian or Cumbrian dialect, a fettle meant a person's mood or state, often assuming the worst, pretty much close to the main meaning. What's your fettle, Mara? 
In ceramics, a fettle is a seam line left by the meeting of mold pieces. I will also put a link into an article from the World Wide Words website that had some other interesting information. So the set phrase is to be in fine fettle. You don't hear it used any other way in most modern iterations, but in Anne Bronte's awful, really subpar novel, Agnes Grey from 1847, you find it in a Yorkshire dialect speech as a passive verb, I'd gotten fettled up. For indeed, miss, I'd no heart to sweep in and fettlin' and washin' pots, so I sat me down in the muck. In Australia, a fettler is a railway maintenance worker responsible for keeping the line in good shape. So that fits. This also gives me a little bit more of an explanation about the ceramic meaning. So in metal casting and pottery, it describes the process of knocking the rough edges off a piece. So those are the ones that I found in this absolutely fabulous novel. There are many reasons to read this novel, but uh, encountering some interesting vocabulary is certainly one. That's all I got. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.